It's time for a Drummer Nation. Jim Payne has a long career as a drummer, educator, producer, and collaborator with the best musicians in jazz and funk. Jim has performed with Maceo Parker, Fred Wesley, Pee Wee Ellis, Michael Brecker, Dave Liebman, and the Radio City Music Hall Orchestra. Currently, he is a member of the online faculty at Berklee College of Music. He now lives in Monterey, California, where he concentrates on teaching and performing, and has a new online teaching course in which he works directly with students from all over the world. Created specifically for practice sessions, quiet tone practice symbols by Sabian are designed to respond and feel like traditional symbols, right down to their clearly defined bell, so the drummers won't have to change the way they play. Quiet tone practice symbols by Sabian. I absolutely love playing drums, and I couldn't imagine uh, not having that in my life. And I really, uh, if I could fac help facilitate that and have an impact on your life so that you could play drums, that means the world to me. When seated at the drums, pressure on the tailbone, lower back, and hip joints can lead to pain. Only Carmichael drum thrones are scientifically designed to relieve and prevent discomforts associated with prolonged sitting. Carmichael thrones, we got your back. Graded specifically for practice sessions, quiet tone practice symbols by Sabian are designed to respond and feel like traditional symbols, right down to their clearly defined bell, so the drummers won't have to change the way they play. Quiet Tone Practice Symbols by Sabian. Jim Payne, welcome to Drummer Nation and thank you for doing my show. How are you, sir? I'm good, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for having me on, yeah. Oh, it's my honor. I first came into awareness of you in the 80s, I think. I used to teach out of one of your books, a funk drumming book. Aha, uh -huh, all right, and, yeah. and I've known you by reputation, but we've never met, so it's it's my honor to meet you at last. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I've, I've written about, you know, six books over the years, various biographies and different stuff, and that book is the bestseller, <laughs> the first one, you know. <laughs> well, that's that's the magic. That's good. But I, I, we'll ask you about all those books in a few minutes. I like to get a little background on everybody. How did you come up and start playing in the first place? Well, let's see. I mean, I my in, in, at home, my mother played the piano, and they said somebody's got to play an instrument. So I said okay, and I, I saw this guy playing the accordion at school, you know, in eighth grade or something, and it looked like he was, he was like a whole band, sound like a whole band, so I said, okay, I'll do that, you know, so I got the accordion, I was living, in, I was in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and there was a big Polish community, and a lot of accordions, so I started studying the accordion, mm -hmm. and then uh, I got into a band that was a, the, with a hundred accordions, it was part <laughs> of the school, it was the craziest thing, you know, and we were playing this song called Wedding of the Winds, you know, and everybody was going up and down, just crazy stuff and uh, I real one thing I realized there was that you could not play and nobody would know you know if you didn't know the the, the piece you know there was a hundred people playing stuff but anyway I wasn't a very good student and I really didn't take to it that much and then then uh, so my teacher gave me over to her son who also played the drums and he would put play in his practice pad while I was supposed to be practicing during the lesson and I thought, well, that looks like something that's a lot more fun than what I'm doing. And right then is, you know, when rock and roll hit, basically, mm -hmm. big time. And mm -hmm. my brother got a Fats Domino record. I think it was Ain't That a Shame or something. And, uh, you know, I just played that over and over again. And I said, man, this is it. You know, so I got a little pad and, and sticks and, and just started playing on my own, listening to records. And then I had some buddies who put a band together. And I traded in the accordion, got the drums. And it opened up the drum set, and we had a rehearsal. You know, so I had no idea what was happening really. And the, the drums, I didn't even tune. I didn't know how to tune the drums. You know, they were like all flappy and everything. They loved it. They thought it was great. They didn't know many more than anything up more than I did. And we started doing doo-wop music. It was called the Deltrons, and we started playing parties and you know church things and whatever. And then, then I got you know more and more into it, and I eventually got into R and B and Whatever, more that's, stuff. That's great that you had a gig before you could really play. <laughs> yeah, I know. When I look back at it, I think, man, the people didn't seem to mind, you know, I just kind of play some kind of groove and they were dancing, you know. So yeah, well, 
That's the beauty yeah. of, of, of that age, too. And coming at it from that way where you're working on groove first and foremost. Yeah. I think it's, it was that way with me. I think it's that way with a lot of drummers. You sit down in somebody's kit and you go, within a matter of seconds, this is yeah. for me. I love this. Yeah, yeah. And I, I like to dance. I was a big dancer, you know. And, uh, and now I think even more so, there's a lot of, you know, dance concepts in playing the drums where you're, you're, you're really kind of, you know, you got your butt sort of on the seat and you're kind of moving to the rhythm. And if you can connect with that, that's great. You know, I mean, look at all the drummers. I mean, Steve Gadd was a dancer. Buddy Rich was a dancer. You know, a lot of great, great drummers also were into dance, too. It's a it's a, a poetry of motion in any event. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's dance to reason with time. We're, we're to dance. that into the drums, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. then that goes out to the people. Exactly. So your first early influences uh, were funk drummers, rock drummers, jazz drummers? Well, you know, my father had this, uh, you know, he, he had some big band records, Benny Goodman, Gene Krupa, and I had this Buddy Rich EP, you know, with him playing some incredible solo I used to listen to. I had no idea what the hell it was. I still don't know what the hell it was. Uh, but it was kind of, you know, it was flashy and interesting, you know. But then when I got the New Orleans stuff, Little Richard and Fats Domino, which I now know is Earl Palmer on a lot of that stuff. That's the stuff that just got me going and couldn't stop, you know, just couldn't stop playing. You know? So I would say unknown, he was one of my early influences, you know, for sure, uh, Earl Palmer. And then, uh, you know, and I actually saw uh, uh, some guys in New York at the Alan Freed shows on the rock and roll shows. I'm trying to think of who that guy was. Maybe I'll, I'll remember, but a, a show drummer, you know, really backed up all the groups that came through and was really, really tight. Hey everybody out there in cyber world, this is Adam Nussbaum. Hi, Dave DeCenso here. Hi, Bermuda Schwartz here. Hey everyone, Stanton Moore here. Hey guys, John Tempesta here. Hey everybody, this is John J.R. Robinson. Hi, Todd Zuckerman here for the Drum Center of Portsmouth. They're knowledgeable, they'll be able to help you and guide you and make the right choices for you and the music that you play. From Wingnut to Wuhan, these chaps know what they're talking about. Highly recommend it. But what do I know? I'm a drummer. So how did you learn reading? Ha! That's a good question. I, I, I didn't, actually. For a long time, I, I played with bands that and we never had. I, all the way through high school and then college, I was in bands. And we just put on the records and learned the tunes and rehearsed and got them together. I, I never read music, and I was always like, oh dear, I don't know how to read music. But finally, you know, after I really got into it in college, and then I got out of college and decided to make it my career, then I went into New York. I was living out in Connecticut at that time. I went into New York and started studying, and I studied with uh, Sonny Igo, who was Tommy Igo's dad, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Henry Adler, and I took a correspondence course in Berkeley, actually, where I, I just finished a chat with Berkeley. Now I teach there mm -hmm. uh, online. But they they taught me how to read. You know, boom, boom. We went through the buddy, the uh, well, we went through the buddy Rich book for the rudiments and everything. But also Louis Belson's Modern uh, Reading in Four Four. Yeah, that's just a great book. Digested that, you know, completely mm -hmm. with Sonny Igo, very slowly going through the whole thing and. And uh, that's how I learned to read. So I think it's great that you came at it from a groove perspective, from a music perspective first, and then picked up rudiments, polishing up your hands, learning how to read. Um, given all those things in the equation, the groove is the most important, right? Right. You know, I I, I do think so. I mean, if you if you feel it and you want to move and you like the 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 motion back and forth, that's that is the most important thing. And then it's just a question of translating that. Uh, you know, and working with the music. If the music requires reading and, you know, you, if you want to be a pro, you have to do that. You know, that's part of the deal. But, I mean, I've heard, I've heard people are playing, you know, pretty high-class gigs, Broadway, whatever, and uh, they could read anything, but, frankly, they don't groove, you know? Yeah. And they, they play everything perfectly and everything, but, like, you know, I just, well, where's the groove, you know? Like, I, I was fortunate I did a stint at Radio City and, uh, you know, with the Rockettes and all that, you know, and, uh, and I, I, I felt really good that Rockettes really liked me, you know, because I had a, I was struggling with the music, you know, I, I had it, I figured it out, I memorized it, but, you know, uh, I had a good groove and they said they, they could dance to it, so. Well, at the end of the day, a, a reading mistake is inconsequential compared to 
following up the groove. <laughs> Especially if you're a dancer absolutely. on stage listening. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And you, you know, you cover off the reading mistakes. And sure, yeah. Knows, you know? now, and you're only reading a few times anyway, right? Eventually you know the show. Especially yeah, if yeah. it's a show that, that you play every night. Now, as you became more educated, you became aware of more drummers, I presume. Who were some of your yeah. other earlier influences and, and right. uh, heroes? Well, the first, one of the first guys I studied with was a guy named Jim Strasberg, who's probably not that well known, but he was a local guy in Connecticut, and he, he got me going. He had studied with Jim Chapin, and we did some rudiments and stuff, and he was a great, great jazz drummer and a great funk drummer, and he's, he's still around down in Florida. Played with Dave Liebman and a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, let's see. I mean, obviously, well, Mike Clark, I got to know Mike, and he was a very big influence. Um, and, of course, David Garibaldi. Fortunately, I was able to uh, to know him as well and still do. Uh, fantastic uh, influence. And then in the jazz world, of course, you know, uh, Max Roach and uh, uh, Philly Joe Jones, who I took some lessons from. He was, he was amazing. Uh, Shelly Mann. Uh, and especially Elvin Jones. I mean, Elvin is my man in terms of uh, the jazz thing and the feel and, uh, you know, digesting of the groove and all that. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's the cat. I would agree. If I'm, if I'm on a desert island for the rest of my life with one drummer, it's going to be Elvin Jones. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I feel the same way. I, yeah. feel the same way. I fortunately got to shake his hand and hang out with him once in the dressing room, and that was a... I got to meet him once too, and I, several times. But the last time I met him, he was at a signing thing, and I, I what are you going to say to him? You play good, you know. So I said, <laughs> Elvin, I love you, man. And he uh, said, Ah, me too, brother. And he, he held my hand, and it was yeah, a very yeah. nice moment, you oh, know. But I couldn't think of anything else to say that was significant other than I, awesome, I love you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. That's you know, I, I love you. So uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's one of my all time, all time, all time heroes. I think what our symbols uh, brought to the Sabian uh, family is that there is more, lots more hand hammering. They're all hand hammered. And so you really have to perfect the hammering technique and where to hammer on the symbol. You know, you don't want to get the symbol too thin in a lot of places. They were willing to try it. And I think we came out with, with a great product that, uh, that is a great musical instrument. You began working with some notable leaders pretty soon after going yeah. to New York, right? Right. Well, the whole thing, you know, I went to New York and I, you know, studied, got my chops together and my reading together and all that. And then basically I, I, I formed a band with some other guys called Slickophonics. Uh, Ray Anderson, great trombone player, Mark Elias uh, and uh, Al Jaffe and Steve Elson. It was kind of a sort of a horn. It was a horn band, it was sort of avant funk. We called it, you know, there was Ray sang, but it wasn't a really vocal thing where you had more sort of instrumental stuff with the two horns really tight. And we did that for like five, five years, five records and a lot of touring uh, in Europe, mainly in Europe and also in the U.S. as well. Uh, I got to uh, play with a lot of different people in different bands. I played in this band called Birdsong Band in New York, and, and that band had the Brecker Brothers, which was incredible. Um, a guy named John Scholl, a great guitar player who unfortunately just passed away. Um, and Pee Wee Ellis would come in and sit in for, for sub for Mike Brecker. Pee Wee Ellis being the guy who wrote Cold Sweat and uh, James Brown's band leader. He had just left James Brown at the time. Uh, and so we got to be friends. And through him, I was able to, you know, meet some other people. Uh, you know, I played in various rock bands as well. A band called the Blues Magoos, which was pretty popular at that time. Um, but the, those, the, guys, the guys from the Birdsong Band and, uh, and Pee Wee, through Pee Wee, uh, got to meet Fred Wesley and then uh, Maceo Parker as well. Those and, are all uh, James Brown guys. Yeah, those are all James Brown guys who would, basically they, were, they had led the band. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then I got out, let's see, I got out of college and, uh, well, I was down house in New York and doing all that stuff and then, uh, when the uh, the Slickophonics kind of broke up, I went down to Florida and worked in a studio called Kingsnake. And you were uh, producing there, right? I was producing. I, I met the, Bob Greenlee was the uh, bass player and the, the uh, producer, the owner of the studio. He's a good buddy of mine from college. And we 
for three years we produced and wrote studio stuff. Uh, you know, uh, Rufus Thomas was there, a lot of blues cats. Um, uh, actually, James Taylor came down to do some stuff with his brother Alex. Um, we did some country, not too much, but you know, cranked out a lot of blues. Uh, Lucky Peterson was down there, played, did a lot of stuff with him. Kenny Neal, New Orleans guys, you know. And did you go so, back to New York, or, or, because I we I think we skipped the section where you were teaching at Drummers Collective and. Oh yeah, right, right. Um, um, and you really were there for ten years, years, right? Yeah, yes, I was. Um, and Drummers World with Barry. Yeah, you know Barry. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Modern Drum Shop, Manhattan School of Music. So oh, you made this... Yeah, right. <laughs> you made right. this... You made the jump into teaching at some point as well. Yes, right? I did. My new site, Stanton Moore Drum Academy, is the perfect online drum learning platform for any level drummer to learn how to play the drums the same way I did, with the advantage of having me road test the material on hundreds of stages, countless clinics, lessons, and master classes in dozens of studio sessions every year. On the site, you'll find over 13 hours of video, dozens of written lessons, and fresh material gets added all the time. I had always been teaching when I first started out, even, you know, when I moved to the New York and lived in the East Village in my basement there, I always had a couple of students, and I was teaching them rock and funk and, you know, not reading so much, but, but you know, they, they were students that I wanted to learn. So I started teaching, and then I, I built that up and then got into uh, Drummer's Collective and worked there for, for a long time, and then also uh, with Joe Cusadas and, and with Barry after uh, was the last one I did before his store closed, but mm -hmm. that was a lot of fun, you know, and I mean, Elvin would hang out there, and you know, right, right. people, Jimmy Cobb was there, and it was a real sort of a meeting point and uh, a great spot. So yeah, and then I got started writing the books, you know, and that's, see, I, what happened was I, I ended up living in a building on 46th Street, which was Henry Adler's building. Henry Adler was a, you know, a great drum teacher and he had a, a drum shop there. And uh, upstairs, what they had studios and Fred, uh, you know, Sonny Igo was up there and uh, some different people, Andrew Surreal was there and I got a studio there. So I started teaching there seriously and actually I lived upstairs right above Henry Adler's uh, studio. So I didn't, he would start teaching at nine in the morning, you know, with all, all snare drum. You know, he only had the snare drum. That was it, you know. And they'd be doing rudiments and blah, blah, blah. I didn't, you know, he had the pad, so I didn't really care that much, but it was a great spot to be, you know, and a lot of people. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, anybody out. would walk into there, right? Yeah. Almost so, anybody. Great, famous drummers there all the time. Oh, yeah. They hang out at the drum store downstairs, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, I so lived in L.A. in the 80s, and Stan, you know, Pro Drum was that way. I mean, anybody uh, could come in, and you could just make the scene and hang with the cats. It was, yeah. I, it's hard to find that these days. It's yeah, really nice. I've heard of that place. So how ironic that you went from a guy who was almost intimidated about reading to teaching and authoring books. Yeah. Well, um, you know, for, at the time, the, the, the funk thing was big, and that was my thing, you know, so... And there wasn't any books on, weren't any books on funk, and so right. I, I was, you know, pretty organized, and you know, had my had enough reading together. I wrote beats, you know, and I could write any kind of beat, mm -hmm. and so I sort of took it progressively, you know, and I had a lot of students by that time, sort of got an idea of how to do it, and been through a lot of different books, and mm -hmm. Henry Adler helped me a little bit, although he didn't publish the book. Um, Mel Bay published the book, but. Uh, I had, you know, I had, I had been out, actually I had been in California for a while, I moved out of New York after I was kind of uh, playing some weird gig, you know, playing a gig, playing gigs like the gig starts at midnight, it gets <laughs> off at four o'clock, you know, it's in some deep basement, you know. Yeah, I've done this. You know, like, uh, I got out of there, you know, almost daylight, and I'm saying, you know, after I'd been in New York about five, six years, and I said, is this what I'm? Is this what I'm supposed to do? You know, is this why I'm here? You know, I don't think so. You know, so, so my buddy Jim Strasberg, who was my first teacher, had moved to California and moved mm -hmm. to San Rafael, and he said, "Hey, come on out." So I went out there, and uh, hung out for three years, playing a bunch of different gigs out there. And when I came back, I lived in Henry Adler's building, and that's when I wrote the first book. Uh, and I had a lot of experience, you know, with playing and playing funk at that time. And I had done, I'd done some tracks out in California, sort of play-along type tracks to go with the book. And so mm -hmm. there was quite a bit of, uh, 
quite a bit of material there, and, and I tried to, you know, lay it out as best I could, and uh, it was it was a good one because, as I said, there wasn't a lot out on funk in terms of studies of books, you know. I so, remember that period I had studied in your book, and I went out to move to L.A. I studied with David Garibaldi, and he had uh, his handouts. He didn't have any books then either, and that was yeah. about it out there, you know. You would... Yeah. Guys would hand out, uh, you know, look, I just transcribed this from Gad, or here's a funk beat from yeah. uh, James Brown or something, but, you know, from yeah. Clyde or Jabba. But there wasn't much out there. Your book served a, a real hand, handy need oh, way back you, then. Man. Thank you very um, much. Wow. Um, so eventually you moved to, to Northern California. Is that where you live now? No, no. I, I, yeah, eventually. After 30 years in New York, mm -hmm. I moved out here about five years ago. And, but you're still teaching. You're involved with Berkeley School of Music as a Berkeley College of Music, I think it is, right? Right. I don't right. want to get that wrong. And, um, I upgraded to college. Yeah, right. And uh, you're teaching online drumming. Right. Or teaching drumming online, I should say. Yeah, yeah, right. How's they, that going? Uh, it's going great. I just had a, a, a Skype session last, yeah, an hour ago. What happened... Uh, I'm I'm the R and B and funk guy, and they have uh, you know a couple of other other cats doing rock and uh, mm -hmm. Afro Cuban, and uh, it's been about five years. And uh, you know I put the course together. It was a long process, uh, you know, it was about a year, and uh, put all that together with a bunch of videos and went up there, and uh, it works just like a college course. You know, each semester is twelve lessons, and we're on lesson eleven now this semester. And the students go through the stuff, and uh, they they do the exercises and everything, and they see a bunch of videos, and then they uh, they record usually two videos to tracks, and uh, they send me those tracks on Sunday. I look at the tracks and make comments. I can do it audio comments, mm -hmm. and then uh, we have one session a week, like like a Skype session, like we're doing now. And uh, it works great because the students are really motivated. You know, they pay their dough and, and they want to learn. And, and I get them, like, I'd say half are young, you know, well, in their 20s, that have an idea of, you know, being a career of drums, you know, really into it. And then half are older folks who have, you know, played drums in the past and kind of want to get back into it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's a difference in, in demographics. But I have... I've had students from Hong Kong, Taiwan, France, Italy, Germany, uh, you know, the Faroe Islands. The whole world. Know. Yeah, as well as all of the U.S. Right. You know. So when they're studying with you through Berkeley, is it for college credit? They're enrolled in the school? Yeah. Well, they're enrolled. They can take it for credit or not take it for credit. But a lot of them do. And it, it counts towards their college degree. I have a guy now who's now going to Berkeley physically after this course and he will get credit for what he's already done with me in, in the online uh, arena that's terrific so, that yeah, isn't really it, technology is amazing these days that you can do that as a college credit for a school on the other side of the country or that we can talk this way i can do television well you know tv yeah. web tv kind of stuff this way let me ask you the question i ask all the great educators i get to talk to it's the 800 pound gorilla in the room we all came up, uh, you know, I'm 62. We all came up of an age when there was there were gigs galore, and we, we all kind of see there's fewer and fewer of that, uh, mm -hmm. of working opportunities. The recording industry is kind of in the dumper. Um, mm -hmm. Drum shops are closing. I don't want to sound too negative. I'm mm -hmm. still very positive. That's why we do these things, right? But yeah. on the other hand, what do we tell these kids coming through school? How do we prepare them to deal with mm -hmm. the musical mm -hmm. professional world they're going to be facing? That is that is the big the big question, you know. Um, I know uh, my buddy David. I uh, can't think of his name. Who's the head of NYU Music? He, he says that he's teaching students life skills. Mm -hmm. So in other words, he gets around the thing, the fact that there aren't that many gigs. By you're going to get something out of this anyway. You know, you're going to learn how to study. You're going to learn how to organize yourself. You're going to not learn how to go out there and get a gig. All those are you know, skills that can be applied to different things. Mm -hmm. I, I'm encouraged, you know, to some extent in the fact that, that, number one, there are a lot of students who do want to learn how to play the drum set and not, you know, tap on keys and make beats, you know. And, and second of all, it seems like that the good stuff that, that, that the his, history of music that's been developing over the years 
that the cream rises to the top and that young people, you know, in their 20s, or they want to hear about Tony Williams, or they want to hear, you know, about Max Roach. They want to find out, you know, what was Charlie Parker doing? So it's not like, you know, that's going to pass. That's going to be there. It's kind of, it's also, it's a question of, you know, music is getting institutionalized. Let's face it. I mean, look at Lincoln Center. There's the San Francisco Center here. And that's where the sort of more artistic stuff goes. It's a little, you know, good and bad because, you know, uh, I mean, what I'm not so wild about some of the presentations of Lincoln Center. It seems like kind of, you know, mm-hmm. a certain way, you know, where, where, where are the cats that can go to the small joints and do whatever they want and then the people dig it because they, they, they understand they're doing passionately mm-hmm. what they want to do. Uh, well, you, you have know, both, it, it, right? It is hard. It is hard. Yeah. You, you, there's only certain things. If you want to, okay, you want to make money. Okay, so you, you join a wedding band. You go to New York and you, you try to get into the uh, Broadway scene, you know. You, you'd be a show drummer. You travel on the road with different shows. Uh, if you're really good, you know, then you start to get some studio work. But the studio work is really, you know, going down. It's a tough one, uh, Mike. I just, uh, you know, uh, what do I tell them? I just, I basically say do what you want to do. If you want to do, if you're passionate about this and you want to do it, do it. I'm exactly. not going to say Hey man, there's not much work, so you better get right. out of it. You no, know? you answered the question, uh, uh, and and let's think about the old cats, man. In the '30s and '40s, they weren't thinking, "What kind of career is this going to be?" You know, they did it because they had to, because they loved it, because it was part of who they were. Yeah. And let That's you know, let the chips fall where they may. But you're either in or you're out. You know, and uh, yeah. I, I think the kids will come up with new ways to do stuff, and who knows what the future holds? There's always yeah. going to be music and good good drummers coming up. I like to think that that people like to see musicians on the stage interacting in the moment in in a natural, you know, passionate way, Mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, lots of drama and lights and machines and, you know, right. Music being canned, as we used to say. You know, there's a not place. Being by there, people. There's a place for everything. Uh, even in New York, where you talk about Lincoln Center, it's what Mercedes Benz sponsors it, and it gets pretty corporate. But you still have Smalls. You know, you still have. Yeah, that's that's one of my favorite places. Mm-hmm. Right? And the 55 Bar. I mean, yeah, that's it. You know, and and that's some great stuff, man. You know, it's been playing there. Those kids are passionate, man. And and now even you know older cats are playing there too. That's the deal. Whenever anybody goes to New York, I say, go to those places, you know. Catch the whole thing. Yeah, that's the deal. You know, that's, that's exciting. So I would take it that you're optimistic about the future of this music. Oh, yeah. And drumming. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's always people, you know, finding out new stuff and playing new things and, you know, doing it backwards and, you know. There are kids coming up doing more stuff with their feet than I can do with my hands. Uh, absolutely. I you know? started into that. I had two bass drums way back when, you know. I did a few little did it it's but now it's like, forget it. Man. It's not my <laughs> thing, but, you know, I recognize it. It's great, yeah. and there's plenty of guys doing cool new stuff. Um, and playing the clave with the left foot and, the, you know, mm-hmm. and then playing everything else, you know. Yeah. It's like a, so let's talk about you. You have a great website, by the way. I was there oh, thank over you. the thank last you week or so. I, and there's a lot of great information. I'll put the uh, the link in, in the video and in the in the notes. And right. there's a cool blog you write. I appreciate that. All right, all right, yeah, it's fun. I got a lot more stuff now. I I gotta get on there, you know. But uh, yeah. But it's not just you know I'm playing here tomorrow. It's it's your thoughts right. and experiences about being a working artist and teacher and offering insight. That's what I'm trying to do. Which right? I appreciate. Absolutely. Right. One, one little quote I saw I wanted to mention to you, 2% jazz, 98% funk. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, Tell me that's where that Maceo, came from. That's Maceo Parker. He, you know, I did was fortunate to do a couple of tours with the J.B. Horns, which is Maceo, uh, Fred Wesley, and Pee Wee Ellis. Mm-hmm. We, did, we did two records, and, uh, and we toured with that. And, you know, Maceo's a, Maceo keeps going. He's unbelievable energy, that guy. I mean, he's just crazy. But he says it. He would say when we were playing, he says, what we're going to do, we're going to do, you know, 2% jazz and 98% funk. And people love it, you know, and, and it's, it's instrumental music, really. I mean, he doesn't, he sings, you know, and so the JB sang, but they were, look, you know, 
gonna have a funky good time, you know, and then basically everybody can sing that, right? I mean, it's like, so they, they did, they were getting across on the, on the, on the music, and so it was, it was great, great experience. Yeah, melodicism was not the strong point of that, but right. that's okay. <laughs> you know, there's room for yeah. everything, and that music is sure makes you move and dance. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Um, hey. Any, anything else you want to float out there before I let you go? Uh, well, I've, I've uh, now transferred the rights and the format of all my most of my books. Give the drummer some, which has a new new uh, new life, and also the new Tito Puente book, which I did quite a while ago with Tito Puente about Latin music and the drum set. Uh, and uh, and my advanced funk drumming are all now uh, digital online, and they're also hard copy online on Amazon, so I throw that out there, and you can get those through the website, and that's been a great boom, you know, because that's, those things now, can you can order it from somewhere else, and Amazon will print it up on demand and send you a hard copy. Isn't that great? Or you, or you can get the, uh, you right. know, the digital version, so that's been a lot of fun, and I have my own private online teaching courses. Which, that's what I wanted uh, to ask you, so somebody can study with you without going through the auspices of Berkeley, right? Absolutely. Yep. They just have to contact me through the website. I'll send you a sample mm -hmm. lesson at jazz and funk, and uh, you can get all the information, get an idea of what it's like, you know. And, well, you're 100% yeah. contemporary in today, man. <laughs> well, I think I just got on it in time, you know. It was like, uh, I'm, I'm happy, you know. I'm really happy about it. It's great. That's know? how I feel. Neither one of us so, are spring chickens, but you got to stay <laughs> hip. you got to stay with it and on top of today, and I, I, you certainly I mean, are doing so. I encourage yeah, everybody yeah. to go to your website. The educational material is outstanding. If you okay. don't, it, when you're there, if you don't know any of the drummers that Mr. Payne is talking about, find out who they are. You need to know that. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I have to appreciate and uh, congratulate you, Mike, for doing the show and keeping the, everything alive. And, oh, thank and you. And putting it out there to new people. You know, well, I appreciate that. I got, I got started in the video thing when I had my symbol company because I could market that way. Uh, ah. And then I just I sold the company to Sabian. and I thought, I love doing these videos. Why don't I get some drummers on record? And, and you know, maybe somebody in 100 years will care about what we had to say. Yeah, of course <laughs> they will. No, it's archived. And plus, you yeah, know, no, I think it's great. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. It's been my honor to, to interview sure. you, and uh, I'll, I'll be talking to you soon. Okay, great, all right. man. Thanks a lot. And don't come down south here without letting me know, all right? I'm in Atlanta. All right. Okay. All right, brother. Take care. All right, Mike. This is your host, Michael Vosbein, and I'd like to thank our friends at Sabian Symbols, Sound Synergies, Stanton Moore Drum Academy, and Drum Center of Portsmouth. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>